Jack Key and greetings. Greetings, everyone. So, uh, so grateful that you were able to join us today. I hope you're happy and well. Tonight, we're in for something very special in this presentation from Plenty Canada. And I'm going to be brief and I'm actually talking fast to allow the maximum time with our special guests, who I have the great pleasure of introducing tonight. And I'll tell you, they're both so talented, compassionate, and accomplished human beings. Uh, I'd like to introduce Larry McDermott, Algonquin. He's the executive director of Plenty Canada an Indigenous non-government organization devoted to protection of Mother Earth, building healthy communities, and promoting cross-cultural awareness of the values of Indigenous ways of knowing to achieve sustainable environments for future generations. A former three-time mayor and council member of Lanark Highlands and chair of the Rural Forum of Federation of Canadian Municipalities, Larry was a commissioner on the Ontario Human Rights Commission and a member of numerous organizations, including the International Indigenous Forum for Biodiversity, the Ontario Species at Risk Public Advisory Committee, the Canadian Environmental Network, UNESCO, and the Ontario Recovery Strategy for the American Eel. Larry has also served as a comprehensive claim representative, is a certified tree marker and butternut sensor, and holds many other environmental certifications. Larry lives in a 170-year-old log home on 500 acres of biologically diverse Algonquin land along Ontario's Mississippi River. Welcome, Larry. And we also have Tim Johnson, Mohawk. Tim is a senior advisor to Plenty Canada, director of the Landscape of Nations Indigenous Education Initiative, artistic director of the Great Niagara Escarpment Indigenous Cultural Map, and artistic producer of the annual Celebration of Nations Expressive Arts Gathering. Tim is an executive producer of the Canadian Academy of Cinema and Television, Sundance Film Festival, and Hot Docs award-winning documentary, Rumble, The Indians Who Rock the World, and is an experienced education, museum, and arts executive who recently helped lead the development of four public memorials and art commissions of national significance that honor the contributions made by underrepresented peoples to Canada, defense and founding. As a former associate director of the museum programs at the Smithsonian's Institution, National Museum of the American Indian, Mr. Johnson managed the museum's largest organizational group across its facilities in both Washington and New York. A long list of critically exhibits, including Live Earth, DC with Al Gore, were produced during his tenure, creating an era that si significantly enhanced the institution's museology and reputation. Active in his home community of six nations of the Grand River and with several prestigious education, arts, and journalism institutions for over 35 years, Tim received the Dreamcatcher Foundation Award for Art and Culture in 2016. Larry and Tim, we're so grateful that you're here with us tonight. We thank you for the incredible partnership, and we look forward to hearing your knowledge tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael, for that. Uh those wonderful introductions. And uh, we're very uh, happy to um, uh, be here with everyone uh, uh, tonight. But I'll let uh, Larry as Executive Director of Planning Canada uh, open this uh, proceeding, <laughs> open this presentation uh, before we move on. But Larry will uh, provide some opening words, then I'll take everyone through a PowerPoint presentation and then Larry will come back around uh, to focus on uh, uh, particular policies and indigenous, the importance of preserving indigenous uh, protected areas. Larry? Miigwech, Tim. Kwe Kwe Kikina, Uamsi Indigenous Cause, Makwan Dodam, Shabbat Abajwan, First Nation, and Dijiba. I just wanted to share brief, briefly uh, a little bit of language uh, because um, more and more uh, we're realizing that uh, knowledge is embedded in, in various languages. Uh, for that matter, um, there are certain perceptions and understandings that, that come uh, uh, even in various uh, European languages. And of course that holds true with indigenous language. Um, I just, uh, uh, I, I spent this afternoon uh, for three hours with um, uh, Parks Canada and um, indigenous peoples from literally coast to coast to coast, uh, talking about uh, not only species at risk and keynote species, but uh, um, 
how do we work together? Uh, what can we learn from Pathways One? And I feel like uh, this is just the next chapter. Uh, I'm excited to uh, share with you. Um, there's a lot of good work that's been done in, in Canada. Uh, it's, it's easy, I think, to be distracted sometimes by um, headlines that where there's conflict. But uh, uh, for me, Pathways One, uh, and the conservation movement in Canada is a good news story. Uh, and certainly Bruce Trail Conservancy has, uh, uh, has played a leadership role in uh, uh, helping people connect to the land and to develop broader understandings of just what that might mean. Uh, so with that, I'll pass the, the feather back to Tim. Thank you, Larry. So I'm gonna have Amanda call up a PowerPoint presentation at this point and we'll, we'll walk through that. What we wanna talk about is some of the uh, work that we've been doing in partnership with the uh, Bruce Trail uh, Conservancy that's, uh, that we've really enjoyed over the past uh, year or so. And then uh, talk a little bit about some of the work we've done uh, with respect to uh, the Niagara Escarpment in terms of uh, mapping uh, indigenous uh, historical locations and destinations and places uh, up and down the Niagara Escarpment from Niagara all the way through uh, Manitoulin Island actually. And uh, talk about some possibilities uh, uh, for the future. So let's go to the next uh, slide. There's a group of us there uh, during a recent, uh, uh, not too recent meeting, but uh, a good meeting that sort of started the, the relationship. One of the first things we did um, was assist uh, with some advisement around the uh, land acknowledgement uh, that the Bruce Trail uh, Conservancy is uh, delivering before its meetings and so forth. And so uh, uh, the part of this process was to identify the particular indigenous uh, nations whose lands the escarpment and the trail uh, work through and to find the proper sort of expression for recognizing uh, the uh, indigenous inhabitation, longstanding inhabitation uh, of the region. And it's, you know, it's quite substantial. Um, we know from having worked with uh, archeologists and geologists on several other projects that uh, indigenous uh, presence in various parts of uh, Ontario, the Southern part of Ontario particularly, goes back some 13,000 years uh, beyond what was originally identified in most people's textbooks. But basically, as soon as the, uh, the, the glaciers were melting back, uh, peoples were there, indigenous peoples uh, were there. And so uh, it's, it's a long, long span of time that has to be taken into account when we think about even moving forward into the, uh, into the future. Next slide. And we developed a, a memorandum of understanding uh, between our organizations uh, to uh, do uh, a couple of things. One was to provide some content for the incredible uh, trail guide uh, that the uh, Bruce Trail Group uh, produces every so often, which I just think is just such a, a cool old school prod, uh, product. I'm not sure if you can see that very well, but you all know what it is, the Bruce Trail Reference Guide. Um, so we, we provided some indigenous content uh, in there, uh, and uh, part of which uh, also represents the work that Plenty Canada has been doing in developing what's called the Great Niagara Escarpment Indigenous Cultural Map. So uh, we have over the past few years now been working on this prototype uh, platform that you can uh, go to and then uh, identify and click on specific locations. And then the importance or significance of the location uh, from an uh, indigenous historical, cultural or natural wor world perspective is, is provided. And so we, uh, we partnered on those, uh, those projects and are looking forward to uh, new things in the future. Uh, one of the things we're looking at uh, as we move forward out of this previous work into new work uh, with Bruce Trail Conservancy is the development of a couple of um, what we're calling uh, uh, healing uh, gardens um, that um, we hope to have one in the northern part of the, the trail and then one in the southern part of the trail. And these are 
also sort of the creation of legacy spaces, but not not uh, public built memorials that I'll, I'll show you uh, in, a, in a little while here, uh, but natural uh, settings and, and uh, uh, plantings that represent uh, indigenous symbolism and so forth. And the use of appropriate trees and, and other plants um, in these uh, settings that become actual places along the trail where you can learn from, from that experience. So staying very close to nature with that, but also incorporating an indigenous element a programmatic element even into uh, into the mix there. So if we can move forward. And here's the the pages in the uh, in the in the uh, the guidebook here uh, about the uh, Niagara escarpment and the uh, indigenous cultural map that we're producing. Go on to the next one. And some of the content that we wrote up and, and placed in there. And you'll see in the bottom of that right uh, page there, the Landscape of Nations commemorative uh, memorial that we're gonna see some shots of a little bit later. First Nations Peace Monument. These are a couple of uh, memorials that we worked on developing over the past uh, six years that are now, now have become important uh, destinations and locations for learning about indigenous history right on the escarpment. And so right along, uh, right along the, uh, the actual Bruce Trail, okay? But what I wanted to do is um, really start with uh, uh, an explanation of sort of what is the, one of the, the core uh, narratives or, or foundational pieces of Haudenosaunee culture that uh, really helps um, uh, present what the original teachings uh, were uh, by, uh, by the Haudenosaunee uh, uh, people. And it has to do with uh, uh, this sort of a, uh, recitation uh, called the words that come before all else. And I wanna talk about this in the context of empathic traditions applied within this age that we're currently in, which is the Anthropocene, this era of uh, human uh, activity that's actually changing the world uh, as we know it. Next. So the Ohanda Galiwadegwa, the uh, Haudenosaunee Thanksgiving address or the words they come before all else is an ancient cultural supplication that serves to remind and instruct its, inherent, instruct its inherents of the relationship to other life forms and the natural laws that govern the forces and energies of existence. Some of you may have heard this address uh, recited at different events. It, it, it takes place at the beginning of most all formal events that happen within Haudenosaunee uh, uh, communities and organizations. And uh, it's sort of a uh, representation of, of identifying and acknowledging all of the various life forms and elements and energies uh, within our environment, within our experience that enable humans to, uh, to sustain themselves. Let's move on. So I'm gonna just continue to talk about it more from a philosophical standpoint, rather than do the, the recitation that, the, uh, that our speakers usually, usually give. Okay, next. So it's really a, a value system uh, based upon ecological knowledge that intrinsically contains principles and morals intended to guide uh, human behavior. Uh, some of this is tied in with the Haudenosaunee creation story, which really sets out a system of, of gratitude and thanksgiving in relation to recognizing various uh, various aspects of our world. Next. And so I call it an empathic tradition. Well, why, why is that? Uh, it's an empathic tradition because it's the intention of this sort of indigenous cultural convention is to nurture emotional and intellectual connections and understandings within human beings in order to diminish distinctions between the self and other, other animals and other elements within our world. Next. And as we know, um, as we've certainly come to know, uh, as the Thanksgiving address certainly reminds us on a repetitive basis that all things are connected. And we know that uh, all life forms, including humans, uh, share matter that is, that is present within our world and within the universe. And uh, so it's important to acknowledge this uh, because uh, the very elements uh, that we uh, have identified 
are really a part of who we are ourselves. Next. Obviously, elements like uh, oxygen, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, um, calcium, phosphorus, potassium, so all of these things <clears throat> resonate within empathic tradition, the responsibility to sensibly engage and communicate the reality of our existence and to diffuse knowledge for the benefit of future generations. Next. So you know, what I've really found really interesting is I've kind of uh, grown throughout my life is what I would kind of call my at least awakening and understanding of the convergence between indigenous cultures and, and science, because in many ways they speak to the same issues. We haven't always been clear about how, how that came to be or how that is, but it's, it's really what I find in terms of my study of, of, of both of those particular traditions. And Larry will talk a little bit more about two-eyed seeing uh, when uh, we get to his, uh, his presentation. Next. So what's relevant to our relationship with the Bruce Trail Conservancy from a cultural standpoint is that this Thanksgiving address is at least, is at least one component of the culture that, that drives our particular indigenous community forward uh, is that it contains an ethic of conservation within the context of human uh, survival, recognition of reciprocity and gratitude. Next. And as I mentioned early, the, the Thanksgiving address is a recitation that opens most all formal gatherings, ceremonies, uh, meetings, uh, anything that happens within the, uh, certainly our Haudenosaunee communities. And it serves as a persistent reminder of our reliance upon other living beings and the forces and energies of nature. Next. I've talked about, you know, how it goes through this, um, really kind of this, um, uh, this field of uh, this, I guess it's like layers. Uh, it starts with the, with the uh, plants and the animals on the, on the earth, the waters, the winds, the sky, the sun, the moon. So it continues to elevate and go up and then uh, recognizing um, uh, the sky world uh, and, uh, and all of those things that made our creation possible. Next. However, what's really important here <clears throat> is that the Thanksgiving address does not position human beings as having dominion over other life forms, but rather as, as equals, as contemporaries, even as relatives. So within our clan system, uh, you know, uh, many of us grew up with this identification with a particular animal. Uh, and uh, that actually does have an effect in terms of how you think about being connected to other life forms. And so when you think about other animals uh, and even uh, plants and other things as being relatives, it, it really changes your perspective and it certainly, it certainly provides uh, uh, additional energy and encouragement to move towards uh, issues of conservation. Next. Yep, so. Just this is kind of repetitive, but again, uh, our ability to sustain ourselves because of all of these creatures, elements, and energies. Next. And, and again, a stimulating empathic triggers and responses that nourish the emotional and intellectual growth and development of human consciousness. I think this is very important towards developing responsible and healthy human, uh, uh, human beings. And then um, sort of adulthood or maturity is achieved when a consciousness blossoms that recognizes the enormous responsibility that humans have as extremely powerful life forms to protect and support the very same creatures, elements and energies that make human life possible. So recognition of that responsibility is uh, really critically uh, important. <clears throat> Next. And this is, this is at the core of the value system for Haudenosaunee people, the Thanksgiving uh, address. There's no, no question, it's the, it's the essential philosophical um, 
philosophical uh, meta narrative, if you will, that really uh, helps us define uh, what our value system should be. And it is a value system that promotes conservation and preservation. And it requires humility in its comprehension or its application rather. Uh, and that's a very, very important aspect uh, to have humility, to uh, be respectful of all of these things that we're connected to. So with that in mind, what I wanted to do then is we're gonna shift to uh, some of the activities that we've done along the uh, Bruce Trail. This uh, is a uh, stone, uh, stone monument here, a cairn that indicates, well, I guess it could be the terminus. It says here, it's the Southern terminus of the Bruce Trail. But if you're actually starting here and heading to North, it's the starting point. This is located in uh, Queenston Heights Park. Next. Okay, next. And had a chance to meet with uh, Michael and then representatives of the Niagara Parks Commission. Queenston Heights Park is uh, a park, is one of the properties, uh, one of the uh, attractions, parks within Niagara Parks. And uh, uh, very important because the trail either, again, either starts there or, or ends there. So we started there at this particular meeting. Okay, next. Next. So right there at Queenston Heights Park is a uh, important new destination of public artwork that uh, I worked on for seven years before it was unveiled and been working on it ever since. It was uh, open to the public on October 2nd, 2016. So uh, not that long ago, it's amazing how quickly uh, time flies. But this park is dedicated to uh, uh, First Nations uh, involvement, Six Nations and Native Allies involvement as allies to the Crown during the War of 1812. Most historians um, have come to a consensus now that were it not for the involvement of First Nations as allies to the Crown during the War of 1812, uh, Canada may very well have been absorbed into the United States. Certainly would not look what, like what it looks like today. So this, uh, this remarkable uh, memorial has a number of elements, about 11 different elements within it. So I, I think of it uh, more as a, an exhibition than a actual memorial or a, a single uh, image memorial. You can see the, uh, the uh, symbol here of the turtle as a symbol of uh, the earth. Headed in the direction of this two row wampum trail and between two historical figures who were bronze statues actually, who were um, war captains uh, for the Haudenosaunee during the War of 1812. On the left is John Norton, and on the right is John Brand. You proceed through this uh, archway that is there to symbolize the um, Haudenosaunee Longhouse. Okay, next. That's John, uh, John Brandt, next. And the two row, uh, the two row pathway here uh, leads to the uh, center of the memorial, which is the memory circle. And that uh, Mohawk word there uh, on that um, Corten steel band uh, around the center there basically means uh, that don't forget or never forget. And you'll see these, uh, these uh, stone walls that are there. That's Queenston limestone, uh, material that's some 400 years old. It was quarried from the Niagara Escarpment just a few kilometers away. Okay, next, next. Next. Sort of a higher view of it, uh, it has sort of a starburst effect. And on each of those walls, there's a, these, these uh, bronze medallions uh, for the six, uh, the six nations, as well as native allies. And then uh, a medallion representing truth and reconciliation as well, uh, peace and reconciliation. And it ends with this uh, tree of peace 
where symbolically the weapons of war were buried under the, uh, the uh, great uh, Eastern pine, white pine tree here. Okay, next. Well, when we develop these types of destinations, we're also uh, conscious of the fact that we have to produce educational content. You, you can't discern enough just through going through the memorial and interpreting all of these uh, various um, artistic uh, installations. So we've been working very seriously on developing educational content uh, uh, around what the memorial represents. Next. We have brought hundreds of students to that location uh, at uh, Queenston Heights Park and, and uh, worked them through a number of uh, sessions and series uh, to gain a better insight into indigenous history and indigenous culture. Next. And we're responding to, uh, as I'm sure your organization as well, the Bruce Trial Conservancy, to the uh, uh, recommendations the calls to action from the, uh, from the TRC. And those, those uh, 94 calls to action are really cover a lot of ground, everything from federal responsibilities to provincial, territorial and municipal government responsibilities as well. And they provide a lot of guidance for organizations also to reflect upon and think about how they can get involved with uh, truth and reconciliation uh, work. Next. Okay, next. Education is a big thing that they uh, call for and we've been developing a curriculum and lesson plans for schools within the Niagara district at this, at this point. And we moved uh, along that pathway uh, a, good, a good way. Next. And next. <clears throat> So one of the things we've done, we put together a uh, round table of, uh, of uh, scholars, academics, and uh, uh, cultural resource people, indigenous language speakers, to help guide the educational content that we've, we've produced. And so this round table was really instrumental in helping us to develop what we call the 10 essential understandings about indigenous peoples of the Niagara region. That's Rick Hill, one of our Tuscarora scholars. Next. It's a meeting at the uh, district school board of Niagara that kind of launched, launched everything in, in, this, uh, in this work. And we've been working with the various school systems and getting feedback from their educators and staff around how best to integrate the content we're producing uh, within the school systems so that it, uh, it basically dovetails with Ontario's um, the provincial guidelines for education about Indigenous peoples. Next. So this is actually the second edition of the, uh, the framework for essential understandings about Indigenous peoples in the Niagara region. This is the, the book that our, uh, the guidebook essentially that our round table produced. Next. <coughs> And so there are 10 essential understandings, uh, one through 10. This one deals with indigenous people's uh, cultures. And then within each of these sort of statements about this particular section or essential understanding there are key concepts. And in those key concepts, all of this was workshop through our, our uh, round table, our intellectual uh, round table. Uh, and in, in, you'll see some highlighted or bold black lines there. And so um, the ones in black are for elementary school and the ones in red indicate connections to the high school curriculum. So teachers can actually go through here, take a look at what these concepts are and understand how those and where those can be worked into the actual uh, teaching that they are required to do. So I'm not gonna go through all, uh, all 10 of these, um, but we're just gonna show you number one and number 10 but they do um, kind of follow along a process of human growth and development. And again, our particular focus here has been on the uh, Niagara region. And so it's tremendous value to all the school systems within the Niagara Peninsula 
uh, around the indigenous history that's there. We end with civic uh, ideals and practices and essential understanding number 10. And what's really key to this, and, and this was uh, part of uh, what I had focused on as well at the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of the American Indian, is so few people actually understand indigenous governance today. But there are over you know, 660 federally recognized um, tribes in the United States and some fairly close similar number of First Nations uh, communities, uh, uh, First Nations groups within uh, within Canada, and uh, each of these uh, each of these nations uh, have their own governance systems and structures and so forth. So, coming around to understanding that Canada's uh, governance uh, includes Indigenous peoples in addition to municipal, regional, provincial, and federal. There's also um, Indigenous governance within Canada. That's just very important to understand that. Okay, next. So these are some of the educators we brought in. We did a lot of teacher training as well. Uh, this is Carl Ben, an expert on the War of 1812. Okay, next. We're going to go through these fairly quickly because I don't want to take up too much time here. Brian Charles, expert on indigenous wampum belts, who actually made these belts. Uh, phenomenally knowledgeable guy. Next. Uh, this is Darren from uh, Mississauga of the, the Credit. And teachers workshopping through some of the exercises we put them through. Okay, let's just keep going, Amanda. Julia Keefe, one of our key educators has worked with us. So we talk about, you know, it's really important to uh, gain a handle on uh, early history so that you understand the antecedents that lead to conflicts that emerge in the press and in reality today. Uh, so many people don't really have an understanding of how these things came to be. So we covered a lot of that. And as we took these teachers through uh, their training sessions, we began with the early history and then ended up looking at contemporary issues so they had a better comprehension of and how to think about and how to, how to assess uh, what was going on through a better knowledge of, of uh, precedent, historical precedent. Next. And we also brought into it um, uh, sort of a youth uh, into the equation. This was a, uh, a band called the Ollivanders that uh, uh, actually is comprised of members of the Six Nations Reserve and also Caledonia, two communities that had basically been at war with each other. And as, as young people, they decided that they were going to make good music and promote peace and love rather than hostility and get through those historical difficulties. So they served as inspiration to our educators here. Next. Uh, we've also worked with the Niagara Falls History Museum on the development of an online uh, exhibition of Niagara's indigenous legacy. Let's just keep going. I think we're running a little bit over in time here. Keep going, Amanda. Just some images here of the exhibition, the online exhibition. Yeah. We produce videos about it. And then uh, we're now to the Great Niagara Scarborough Indigenous Cultural Map, a project that Plenty Canada uh, began. Let's move forward on this. It contains uh, online uh, uh, stunning photography, captivating video, contextual information identifying these important Indigenous historical, cultural, natural world locations along the Bruce Trail and the uh, Niagara Scarborough. Next. This is the, uh, the landing page for it, and then you enter. Next. And here you can see a field of, of these blue pins, all of which are uh, provide some information about an important indigenous uh, location uh, within the map. Okay, move forward. You click on a pin. You can get access to uh, lots of information about the importance of that site. Next. 
uh, photography. This again, we're, we're staying with this theme of the landscape and nation's memorial since you're already familiar with it. Next. Opening ceremonies, next. And it is a war memorial. So every November uh, we gather with indigenous veterans uh, to uh, pay our respects to all those who contributed to uh, making Canada what it is today. Next. And we provide additional resources, uh, mentions of other places to get more knowledge about that particular history. Next. And Plenty Canada is also, this is also germane to the relationship with um, the Bruce Trail Conservancy. Um, Plenty Canada has been working with a couple of universities on uh, identifying indigenous plant life. Uh, in this particular case, a project with Brock University, identifying uh, indigenous plants along the Laura Secord Legacy Trail that leads from Queenston Heights Park to the First Nations Peace Monument in Thorold. Next. We'll just go through these fairly quickly, Amanda, just show some of the information we've compiled. We have over a uh, hundred uh, hundred indigenous plants and trees and, and whatnot that have been located along the trail. It's a 31 kilometer trail. And just flip uh, through these fairly quickly. So this is a tremendous resource. We're also working with uh, Guelph University on doing a similar thing along trails within the Greenbelt area. The Greenbelt, as many of you will know, really goes from Niagara all the way up to Tobamori, a sort of, sort of thin slice along that area, but also hooks over, heads east uh, over and across uh, Toronto. So we're in the midst of a major project uh, funded by the Greenbelt Foundation on that right now. So I just wanted to go back and talk about legacy spaces next. Some of the, from some of the uh, memorials and public parks that we developed. So here's the landscape of nations again. Let's go next. And then the uh, statues that you saw earlier, the bronze statues, they were originally cast in this sort of paper composite material, which are also the, really you could consider these the original statues. Those are now permanently on display at Brock University. Next. This is the first uh, nation's peace monument in Thorold, uh, which is the terminus of the Laura Secord Legacy Trail. This was designed by uh, world-renowned architect, Douglas Cardinal, who Larry and I recruited to uh, participate in this particular project. This was unveiled in 2017. Next. And you can see how once you develop these these public uh, memorials dedicated to indigenous peoples, uh, it, it's fascinating how they come alive and become symbols and destinations for people. So after all of those um, children's uh, remains were found at the Kamloops uh, Indian Residential School, many, many people brought these uh, offerings really uh, uh, to, the, to the First Nations Peace Monument. You can see that here. Okay, next. Uh, this is another park I'd worked on in Niagara and the Lake. Uh, it's not on the escarpment, but it's uh, very close to it. And this is um, uh, Voices of Freedom Park dedicated to African Americans who made contributions to, uh, to Canada's development. And uh, this was unveiled in 2018. Next. And this is a stunning, uh, a stunning uh, contemporary or modern artwork by Lily Ossishevich that was unveiled in 2019. It's on the First Ontario Performing Arts Center in St. Catharines. So again, pretty much along the route of uh, the Bruce Trail in some ways, certainly along the route of the uh, Laura Secord Legacy Trail. Um, in, a, in an art class, I could explain the nuances of this, but <laughs> we'll move on in, in the interest of time. And we work a lot with the organizations. Here's the Shaw Festival, and you can see they're flying a Haudenosaunee flag um, outside of their main festival there. So we're finding a lot of uh, real interest by organizations, municipalities, uh, in uh, getting more involved in, in Indigenous uh, acknowledgement. So it's been, it's been wonderful. 
Next. Number of partners uh, with us on the Indigenous Cultural Map are very proud to have Bruce Trail Conservancy as a part of this ongoing work. We expect the map to continue to develop over uh, several, several years. It's sort of a, a living uh, organism itself. And we just want to deepen its uh, resources within the, within the, within the map. So uh, it can ultimately result in a, itself a sort of a pedagogical platform for education. <clears throat> Okay, next. And public programming, we'll go through this very quickly and I'll just close out. But um, when I was at the uh, National Museum of American Indian, uh, my role as associate director for museum programs was to oversee exhibitions and programs. And so I just wanna sprinkle this idea uh, into the minds of people who are very much involved in the Bruce Trail. Uh, I think of the Bruce Trail, uh, obviously as a, as a wonderful nature, way of preserving nature. Uh, 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 and an activity. It is in some ways, uh, the way I think, uh, an exhibition. Uh, when you think about all the plant life that can be uh, seen along the trails, about the vistas that you can look at, everything that you can explore, it's like a living exhibition. And so there's always possibilities. What, what I used to do is combine our exhibitions with public programs that would help bring exhibitions alive and deep in people's understandings of the creative uh, applications of these things. So um, as uh, Michael mentioned earlier, we had produced uh, Rumble, The Indians Who Rock the World as a film, but that really began as an exhibition at the Smithsonian Institution. But uh, after we did the uh, exhibition and followed by the, the film, we put it on tour. So the next few slides will be just showing uh, group that we put on tour. That's uh, Kenny Lee Lewis from the Steve Miller Band, along with Juno Award winner Derek Miller uh, from Six Nations. There's a guy behind them by the name of Ryan Mikuloff, who's an amazing drummer, works with the Bruce Trail Conservancy. Okay, next. Charlie Lowry, let's just run through these, Amanda. And this toured, uh, this toured uh, several cities uh, uh, across Ontario uh, three years ago at this point to tremendous reception. So I only place this here to plant the seeds about how public programs might be conceptualized and developed along the, the Bruce Trail that draws more public attention to the, the trail itself and also everything that the organization itself represents in terms of conservation and encouraging more and more people to, uh, to join the organization. Uh, I myself am a, a very proud uh, member of the Bruce Trail Conservancy. I think it's one of the most effective organizations around in terms of how it accomplishes what it, it seeks to accomplish. It's very practical and pragmatic and I, I love that part of it. Okay, next, Amanda. So just to wrap up here, conservation and reconciliation are within our grasp when vision and, uh, and consistent and persistent attention and dedication are applied. Developing projects that are transforming the public's understanding of and engagement with indigenous peoples is possible, but not only that, in fact, it's happening as we've just shown you through the work that we've done over the past six years. And to wrap up here, so the Bruce Trail has a profoundly important heritage and many superlative qualities and characteristics that I believe make it a national model for conservation and for reconciliation. So I thank you for uh, staying with us and sitting with us throughout this early presentation. And at this point, I wanna turn it over to Larry to talk about the importance of uh, indigenous protected areas and about, uh, about two-eyed seeing and some of the other things that he's very, very much active in these days on, on the, the work that he guides Plenty Canada through as an indigenous organization. Larry. Thank you, Tim. Uh, I just wanna double check uh, Michael. Um, I, I, I want to make sure my understanding is, uh, is correct here. We want to leave some time for questions, comments, uh, answers. Uh, what's our time frame for that? Um, yes, a great question, Larry. So um, 
it was scheduled to go to six, but we're so happy for your knowledge. And so we're happy to stand a little bit uh, longer and we can get to some questions afterwards. We really want to hear what you have to say, Larry. Okay. Uh, I, I think I'll still trim my sails here a little bit. Um, but uh, that means I, I wanted to make sure that the next 15 minutes uh, wasn't uh, the total of what we, what we have left. So I uh, appreciate knowing that. Um, yeah, so Tim's invited me to, to talk about uh, things like uh, two-eyed seeing, um, uh, indigenous protected and conserved areas, uh, and also the, the healing place, um, uh, a concept that we've shared with Bruce Trail. And in fact, we had a meeting uh, this morning on the one here in, in Eastern Ontario. Uh, and I, I continue to appreciate the concept and uh, the things that uh, quite a diverse uh, group of organizations and, and people are involved with. Let me just quickly start with uh, Pathways One. So uh, Pathways One was uh, Canada's follow through on global treaties, in particular, the Convention on Biodiversity, but also um, with respect to uh, climate change, it uh, was very much part of the process. Uh, unique in terms of uh, Canada identifying priorities, um, seeking recommendations to activate those priorities was a governance system that uh, reflected Canada's origin story. Well, the super fast uh, version of Canada's origin story is uh, recognizing that the Constitution Act of 1982 uh, makes specific reference to the Royal Proclamation of 1763. And uh, which led to the Treaty of Ni uh, Treaty of 1764 or Treaty of Niagara, and of course um, that uh, history uh, came together. Um, there were uh, between 2,000 and 2,500 Indigenous uh, representatives from 24 uh, First Nations who came together, met with uh, the British Crown under uh, Sir William Johnson, and uh, negotiated. Uh, with full sovereignty acknowledged in writing by the British Crown, uh, negotiated uh, terms for sharing the land. Wasn't perfect, but um, natural law was cited. And there were protocols that were agreed upon. Uh, Sir William Johnson had the skills uh, to understand those protocols. Um, well, he had eight children with uh, Mohawk clan mother, Molly Brandt. And um, uh, so uh, all sessions were open in ceremony, closed in ceremony, wampum. You saw some images that uh, Tim provided of wampum belts. Uh, and th that was uh, exchanged. Uh, and there, there was a, a, a treaty of 1764 wampum belt. Um, so what was agreed to, uh, in, in my view, uh, was to um, bring both Western and Indigenous knowledge systems and legal systems together. As uh, Indigenous uh, scholar and, uh, and head of the Indigenous uh, Law School at the University of Victoria, um, uh, an, a Anishinaabek uh, lawyer, scholar uh, from um, uh, an Ojibwe First Nation in, in uh, uh, in Ontario, uh, and he talks about the inculcation, the intent to, to learn about uh, each other's legal systems, ways of knowing that that was really the foundation for Canada. Um, and so that, uh, that approach uh, was agreed to um, by the co-chairs, and that was uh, Catherine McKenna and Shannon Phillips. Uh, Catherine uh, was the uh, federal minister of the environment and uh, Shannon Phillips was uh, the minister of the environment for Alberta under the NDP government. They agreed to uh, this model that um, some quick examples, uh, the smudge and gavel were considered uh, to be uh, equivalent Robert's rules of order. Uh, the seven gifts, um, which are uh, an Anishinaabek 
uh, they're sometimes referred to as a grandfather, even uh, grandmother, grandfather teachings. Uh, that was by no means a, 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 that was the system that was used. Uh, the system could have used the words before all else. Uh, it could have used a lot of other indigenous iterations. The point was, is that it made accommodation for oral knowledge transfer and uh, Western written transfer, at, uh, how the meeting was conducted. We started out with a pipe ceremony. We closed it with a pipe ceremony. We made sure that everyone felt equal. There were no, we openly and, and uh, repeatedly stressed that uh, there was no hierarchy in that circle. I'm watching a deer walk up my driveway here. Um, and uh, uh, so recommendations came out of that. They were presented in written form with uh, copyright, but also um, the elders involved uh, recommended a videotaping of the oral presentation by co-chairs and uh, a QR code was the contemporary methodology of providing the same protection for their oral uh, knowledge transfer. Um, and a bundle uh, was created uh, with those written documents, with the video, uh, and with um, uh, tobacco, uh, and later on, uh, Métis sash. Uh, and that bundle gets transferred from uh, minister to new minister. That needs to happen, will happen um, in uh, the end of March. Um, so what's important there? A couple of highlights, uh, and I highly recommend looking at We Rise Together that came out of the Indigenous Circle of Experts, the National Advisory Panel that represented agriculture, um, uh, forestry and mining, along with environmental groups and some indigenous representation, produced uh, uh, reports. What I um, I worked a lot with uh, the National Advisory Panel, and um, uh, recommendation one talks about recognizing and accepting uh, a common uh, indigenous value that we. Uh, and uh, principle that we are one species among many who uh, share the earth. Um, and that reconciliation is uh, a key component of uh, following through on these international treaty obligations uh, to uh, deal with climate change and to deal with biodiversity loss. This has uh, resulted in um, a, the a number of efforts uh, around the country, some very small, some much larger. Uh, it resulted in a, in a program of uh, indigenous protected and conserved areas. And a big uh, part of Canada achieving its protected area goals, uh, which are um, really were defined in uh, Nagoya, Japan in 2010. I attended the Earth Summit. I was in Nagoya in 2010. Um, and, uh, and those goals uh, uh, will, will grow uh, in um, uh, the next global meetings known as uh, COP, Convention of the Parties. Um, and uh, uh, we're, we're going from uh, less than 10% um, to 30% uh, will be the goal in 2030 of Canada's territory of its uh, entire of the entire country falling under a protected uh, definition. Uh, I won't get into the nuances. I mean, there are um, uh, definitions that are changing about what that means, but it still means protection, still means uh, exercising our responsibilities. Um, and so, uh, all of this work is done in, in, under the concept of uh, what Albert and his late wife Merdina coined the term two-eyed seeing when they created the integrated science department at the University of Cape Breton. But it's something that, that's been applied. It was applied uh, in uh, Pathways One, continues to be applied uh, in all kinds of efforts. I know Tim and I hear uh, the concept uh, being uh, referred to uh, often. Uh, I have the uh, great uh, 
pleasure and privilege of working with Albert Marshall and the uh, Elder Circle of the uh, Conservation Through Reconciliation Partnership that's uh, housed at the University of Guelph. There are other academic partners, there are NGO partners, there are all, uh, First Nation partners, uh, and a lot of work flowing out of that. Um, so two I'd seeing is the concept of um, finding ways of sharing um, the uh, epistemologies associated with indigenous knowledge systems and with Western science, finding ways of, uh, of bringing both knowledge systems together, not necessarily integrating them, uh, or, or even that one has to validate the other, but finding ways of respectfully bringing the knowledge that comes from those systems to apply to our key uh, conservation challenges. I'm gonna uh, quickly uh, talk about uh, the healing place, uh, and the healing place concept. It emerged when uh, the Assembly of First Nations was looking to offset a climate change conference in the Yukon just before uh, COVID um, leaped out at us uh, in March of 2020. And um, they wanted to, uh, plant trees to offset the travel impact. And this uh, led to uh, partnerships um, with Forest Ontario, with uh, OPG, South Nation Conservation, Aquasasne First Nation, uh, Shabata Bajwan uh, First Nation, Pakwakanon uh, First Nation, um, and uh, the Upper Canada District School Board and others. Um, the layout was done uh, in, to reflect cultural values of uh, both Akwesasne and, well, I'll say Haudenosaunee and, and Anishinaabek uh, values. Um, and so you have uh, 13 uh, cedar trees around that uh, circumscribe the site representing uh, the 13 moons of the year. Um, iconic species like uh, the white pine, uh, the uh, tree of peace, that, uh, which is a Haudenosaunee um, uh, uh, iconic tree uh, that Tim's already pointed out and showed on the site that he referred to. Uh, and then uh, there's maple tree, which is considered uh, a veteran and a leader by both cultures and much more. In the center, uh, a medicine garden, uh, also some uh, the Three Sisters, other agricultural plants uh, to uh, reflect um, food sovereignty values and that forests and feeding ourselves uh, are not separate. They, um, there's a, a synergy there. There's also uh, a, a reconciliation uh, children's area uh, that's integrated in the, in the concept. Um, so uh, as um, uh, uh, we've had discussions um, uh, with the Bruce Trail Conservancy about establishing uh, a couple of uh, healing places, and um, there's a lot of potential which way uh, they might be designed or even uh, what size they, they might be. Um, and. I'm looking at the time and I'm seeing that I'm very close to the six o'clock mark. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, I think I'll, I'll stop there, uh, Michael, um, knowing that uh, maybe some people uh, have uh, other things to do and, um, but yet may wanna ask questions. So uh, I think I can expand on what I, you know, the, the uh, uh, information that I've put on the table here through that process. So I'm gonna pass the feather back to you and uh, welcome and invite uh, uh, people to ask those uh, questions or make comments. And I just wanna appreciate uh, each and every one of you who uh, took the time uh, tonight to um, spend with Tim and I and uh, share uh, this imp important relationship building exercise. This is very, very important, especially as we, uh, you know, we're all mindful of, uh, uh, of how climate change is, it's uh, accelerating. 
uh, how we need to do this work more than ever, and especially mindful of our children and generations to come. So, Chi Miigwech, thank you, Michael. Back to you. Thank you very much, Larry. And um, I, I wanted to tell you both, I uh, haven't had a chance to tell you, and uh, I'll tell everyone attending, but the BTC did just submit 73 of our nature reserves for consideration towards Canada Target One Challenge, and they were all accepted. So we're now officially counting towards the, the Canada goals and the global standards, and we're really proud of that. So thank you. That's you. Uh, fantastic. Yeah, that's great, Michael. Much appreciated. Yeah, and we're going to continue. That was just uh, get, getting the ball rolling, but we're going to continue to do that work. So thank you very much. I've got a question here from um, Janet. And, uh, and again, thanks for taking the time to answer these questions. It says, I volunteer with a Bruce Trail committee that's focused on biodiversity. We'd love to organize a hike with an Indigenous guide to educate people about Indigenous knowledge, teachings around biodiversity and plants, trees, etc. Do you have ideas around how we can find someone to assist in this? We, oh, uh, we, we, go ahead, Tim. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a fantastic question. Yeah. The, uh, the project that we're currently working on uh, with Guelph University and funded by the Greenbelt Foundation will result in a, an indigenous trail guide uh, of the, the plants that are found uh, uh, along the, uh, the Greenbelt. So yes, that is in the works. Uh, we're working with a, a team of uh, advisors one of the leads on it in terms of the lead ecologists we have is uh, uh, Dr. Jessica Dolan. And then we're working uh, through her with a number of indigenous allies uh, on, that, on that work. So uh, I think uh, that's a great question because it's something that's been in our minds for quite some time. And ultimately, you know, we, we believe it's important to develop products that actually provide and disseminate that education to, uh, to people. So. That's great. Okay, thank you, Tim. We've got a question here that Michael, says, oh, go Michael, ahead, Larry. I just, I'll just, I'm gonna add, and uh, it's important what Tim mentioned, but I also, uh, I know, um, I'll just uh, simply put, uh, I think in in this upcoming year and, and, and the year after, uh, there is funding emerging that will allow us to do uh, some field trips. And we've done, done them in the past, as Tim knows. Uh, we've done uh, trips on the Laura Secord Trail, for example. Uh, it could easily be done. Uh, and there are a number of people uh, that could do that. Uh, I love them. I, I enjoy, uh, I was glad to hear the question. There's so much to be learned and shared, um, uh, you know, with other, with anybody that's a keener that loves plants and animals. It's, uh, it's always a lot of fun. It's one of my favorite things to do. Yeah. Yeah, so we've okay. worked with a couple of uh, plant, uh, indigenous plant knowledge holders, uh, uh, Alyssa General and also Megan Hamilton and, and others as well. So, and uh, it's like Larry mentioned, it's really fun to be out on the trails with them. So we could help facilitate something sooner than the, uh, the development of the, uh, of the trail guide. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. The, the next question is in regards to the Indigenous cultural map. And um, the question is, uh, is it still in development? And I remember Tim, you saying it's fluid and it's going to grow. But there's a question here for a lot of the pins around Hamilton. Um, there's some Indigenous cultural significant areas that could be added. As an example, the Bear Meeting Place in Red Hill Valley. Oh. <laughs> So, so that's a yes, question and a we, comment, uh, but uh, I'll let you take that. No, I mean, it's, it's, uh, that's why we think it's still in prototype phase. Well, well, we know it is because there's so many locations that we can still add to it. It's just been a question of resourcing. So it grows as we get the resources to actually, uh, you know, uh, invest in the research and the writing and the photography and all of that. Uh, we'll continue to add sites. So uh, we're open to all recommendations, please send those to us. Uh, that would be fantastic. We do have uh, grants in place now that would uh, resource our ability to add more sites to the map. Okay, great. I could I could take an hour to answer that question, um, but I won't, of course. <laughs> but uh, uh, Rick Hill, uh, Tim, weren't you on that uh, trip as well? Didn't, anyway, 
quite familiar with it, quite familiar with the whole background, how it came to be, uh, and the opportunities uh, for other sites. Uh, I think there's tremendous uh, potential there for sure. Yeah. Okay, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, there's a comment here that says I have to go, but I wanted to thank you for sharing. You're so inspiring. So I wanted to share that with you. Uh, there's a question here from Sherry. And the question is, there was a reference made to the development of indigenous healing places along the Bruce Trail. Where do we learn more about this work? And so uh, I'll just say the work is just starting, but maybe Tim or Larry, could you talk about what a healing garden is and how people might think about that? Well, uh, I'm going to I'm going to say that uh, on our website, uh, we have a shared story, uh, which includes that there were some bumps in the road, just uh, um, learning to work cross culturally. Um, and so we felt that it was important to share that story and how we corrected it. Uh, so it's important to know that sometimes um, in this type of work, uh, there will be challenges. Um, and um, uh, as long as we're prepared for those challenges, then um, uh, we're all going to grow. I mean, a big part of it from Indigenous perspectives is it's about relationships, not only with each other as human beings, of course, but uh, that's, a, that's a big part of the, the governance, the creativity, and, uh, and the accommodation. Uh, I know Dr. Reg Kroshu, the lead elder on Pathways One, uh, the last we celebrate um, the, uh, the handing over of uh, those reports uh, in uh, 2018. Uh, we do it every year at the end of March. And he talked about there's still, we still need to work on the accommodation piece that it's so easy to uh, go back to the um, de facto Western uh, science approach or, or cultural approach. And so we have to take, the, take our time uh, to, to uh, make sure that's balanced. Uh, I can tell you the healing place, um, the first one has, uh, has learned a lot, but it's very effective. So that you've got conservation uh, authority, you've got, um, you know, various NGOs, OPG, Forest Ontario, uh, Plenty Canada. And uh, I, today I marveled, I just marveled at how well people are working together, um, how they're finding uh, solutions. It succeeded my expectations. But anyway, that story, um, yeah, can be found. And you know, Michael, what I can do is I'll try to find a PDF of it. I'm not 100% sure that everything that's supposed to be up on our website on that one, because as a partnership, we tried to come up with a common story. We were talking about it today and, uh, and even, yeah, some small, like things like logos, are they all in place? Um, and do they reflect on site? We have all partners logos. We have three languages, Mohawk, Algonquin, no four, English and French. Um, so, uh, I'm happy to get that information. If it's not on our website or real easy to find, I'll, uh, I'll make sure it gets forwarded to the Bruce Trail Conservancy to you, Michael. And, and so that uh, people can see that story. Yeah. And Larry, I've been posting links to Plenty Canada's website, uh, as we've, as you were making her presentation and answering these questions as well. So. Uh, your audience members, Michael, can just click on those links or copy them for future reference. And uh... Okay, that's really helpful. Thank you. I've Thanks. got a question here now from Diane. Um, and Diane says, my name is Diane. I'm a second generation settler. Honored to be participating from Treaty 3 and 3 quarters territory just below the Niagara Escarpment in Burlington, Ontario. And she used the Haudenosaunee word, but I'm not going to try and say it. Tim, maybe you can teach us how to say it. Um, Diane says she's involved with some BTC efforts related to invasive species, and she's interested in hearing local indigenous perspectives on these plants. And she's seen mention of plant-based weed management by indigenous peoples that uh, she's heard about. So could you please help with that? Okay. Uh, we actually uh, produced a, a booklet 
on Aboriginal uh, perspectives on invasive species in Eastern Ontario. Um, and uh, Henry Lickers was a big part of that. He's now, he's the first Indigenous uh, International Joint Commissioner of the Great Lakes. Um, I'll just put it this way. Uh, I, I would say, and, and risking uh, oversimplifying things, but uh, one of the principles is that once an invasive species gets here, uh, if our control mechanisms, um, you know, have been breached, then we have to kind of work uh, with that species. I know Wal Walpole Island, uh, uh, a First Nation that's been a leader in conservation for decades um, in terms of interacting uh, with um, Western science and culture, um, they actually had a, a, a contest with Phragmites on what members of the community might be able to do. And so that somebody built uh, a number of um, shelters for, uh, for kids that are waiting for the school bus uh, out of them and including a thatched roof um, that was uh, uh, very effective. Um, so, you know, there's other stories like that. That just, to me, that illustrates a, a perception. It's, it's kind of, uh, and interestingly, uh, Chris Craig from South Nation Conservation sits on the Ontario Invasive Plant Council. Uh, I think he's the only indigenous person, but uh, yeah, he was talking about purple loose strife and how nature finds a way uh, in, in due course to bring about uh, some balance. Doesn't mean that we don't uh, uh, practice um, eradication uh, but more often it's mitigation and, and, uh, and learning uh, to work with it. Uh, and in, I would say that from an indigenous perspective, sometimes the cure is worse than the, the illness. Uh, and that's our concern about contaminating waters, lands, uh, and having a, a far more injurious uh, impact than the invasive species itself. Okay, that's helpful, Larry. T Tim, anything to add to that? No, Larry's our uh, our resident uh, ecologist. Expert. Okay, so fantastic. Take those, uh, take those questions. I did want to mention, uh, Michael, that I did reference in the in the chat area that uh, Planet Canada had been working with the Royal Ontario Museum in developing a uh, Indigenous audio tour that's going to be built into their new exhibition called Dawn of Life, and uh, I think by April or so that component will be added to the exhibition and I would encourage everyone to, uh, to check it out. It's, okay. a, it's a stunning, uh, phenomenally well done exhibition. And uh, the, the museum asked us to uh, provide some indigenous perspective on it, so. Okay, that's wonderful. Um, I, I think that's it for the questions. Tim's been going uh, and answering a lot of them in the chat. So for those of you that are watching, Again, we're going to be sending out a recording of this. You'll get that in your email tomorrow, along with all of the links that Tim has been sharing. So, um, so that sort of concludes our question and answer. And Larry and Tim, I just want to sincerely thank you both for your time, your knowledge, and your sharing with us today. We're so proud and grateful of this partnership with Planning Canada and with you. And we, we promise to uh, make this an important focus for our organization. And we're just absolutely thrilled for everything that you've taught us so far and for all the great things we're going to do together. So for those of us that have been on Indigenous learning journeys, you always bring such great hope to your presentations and to your messaging. And um, we're just so thankful. So thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Okay, well, have a great evening. Thanks everyone for joining us. And again, watch for the links tomorrow. And uh, again, thank you, Larry and Tim. Very, uh, very, very grateful. Okay, good night. Oh, appreciate it.